we have so far looked at three basic tissues. We have looked at epithelial tissues, connective tissues, nervous tissue, and today we therefore want to look at the last basic tissue, which is propulsion tissue. Basically, propulsion tissues refer to cells which have the capacity to contract. The things you're going to learn here are the following. We are going to state the functional properties of muscular tissues. We are going to name the different types of muscle cells that we do have. And for each muscle cell, there are some things you are going to look at. One of them is the histological properties. How do they look like under a microscope? So we'll deal with that. Then we are also going to look at the physiological properties. And in physiological properties, <clears throat> we'll also be looking at how they contract and specifically one of them. Then we are going to look at the distribution of each of these muscles. Where are they found? After we have done that, then we'll outline the differences between these muscle tissues. So it's a straightforward lecture and a short one most likely for that matter. Let's begin with the properties of muscle tissues. If we start with the functional properties of muscle tissues, we can say the following about functional properties of muscle tissue. Muscles are excitable. This is the ability of a cell to respond to a stimuli by generating electrical impulses. So excitability is a property of muscle in as much as it was also a, pro uh, a property of nervous tissue. Those two tissues are excitable. Conductivity is also a property of muscle tissue. Conductivity is the ability to transmit electrical impulses along the cell membrane. So similarly, both muscles and neurons can conduct electrical impulses in as much as the neuron is the one particularly adapted to conduct this one from one cell to another. Muscles can also conduct this one, at least along their cell membrane for the sake of their responses, which is now unique to muscles. And that response is the response of contraction. Now, contractility is the ability to shorten. Muscle cells can shorten. This is unique to muscles. No other tissue we've talked about so far could do this. Extensibility is the ability to increase in length. Again, this is unique to muscle. Out of the basic tissues we talked about, extensibility has not been mentioned, but this is an intrinsic property. So muscles can shorten and increase in length. There are three types of muscle. there is what we call smooth muscle. When we talk of smooth muscle, it doesn't really mean the texture so that you think that the next one should be rough muscle per se. No, we are going to see why they're called smooth. We have skeletal muscle and we have cardiac muscle. We are going to talk about these three types of muscle each uh, one by one, 
looking at what we've talked about regarding the objectives, we'll look at the histology of each, look at the distribution of each, we'll look at the functions of each perhaps, and we'll also look at the physiological properties of each. So let's begin with skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are called so because they're attached to bones. So that addresses the issue of the distribution. Skeletal muscles are attached to bones. They can attach to bones directly or through tendons like this. That's a tendon, that's a tendon, that's a tendon. But you can also have direct attachment where the muscle just attaches directly onto bone, like from here to that region there. It's attaching to bone there directly. So muscles, these skeletal muscles are attached to bone. That's why they're called skeletal muscles. Now that they're attached to bones, what's their role? Their key role is in movements. When these muscles contract, they cause motion across the joints that they are crossing. Or rather, let me say they cause motion on the joints they are crossing. For example, this muscle is crossing this joint. And so when it contracts, it will move this joint. This muscle cannot move this joint because it is not crossing that joint. But it will move this joint because it's crossing this joint. That's why when it contracts, it can cause that flexion. And when it relaxes, it can then cause, okay, it will not cause the flexion. But then the other one is uncontracting it will cause extension. So they only cause movement on the joints they are crossing. The other key function of skeletal muscles is that they are responsible for generation of heat. This is particularly important when it is cold. So usually what happens is that the skeletal muscles will contract in that act of shivering so that heat is generated for the body when it's cold. These are the two key functions of skeletal muscles. I know you are tempted to add other functions like, oh, contribute to shape. Now, who cares about that? From physiology point of view, I am okay with this too. So let's look at the histological features of skeletal muscles. Generally, when we talk of any muscular tissue, there are some features you want to talk about. One of them is the shape of the cells. How do the cells look like under light microscopy? You also want to look at the number of nuclei in each cell? Is it one? Is it two? Or is it many? Then you want to look at the location of the nucleus. Is the nucleus at the center? Or at the nuclei at the center? Or at the nuclei in the periphery of the cell? You also look at the arrangement of actin and myosin. The actin and the myosin, are they arranged in a regular pattern or the arrangement is haphazard? And lastly, you look at how the cells run or join with each other. And there are many variants there. And so let's narrow this to skeletal muscle. The image on your left shows you how skeletal muscle cells look like. So 
So this image shows you how skeletal muscle looks like. We want to look at this and tally on this basis. So let's start with the shape of the cells. This is how the cells are running. So that's one cell, that's another cell, there's another one, that's another one. So you can see them here. You realize that you cannot see the end of each cell. Why? Because they are very long. And so, based on the first concept for skeletal muscles, we say the cells are elongated. The term fiber is used to mean muscle cell. So whenever I say muscle fiber, it means muscle cell, the same concept. So skeletal muscle fibers are elongated, very long cells. You can imagine there's a muscle that comes from your pelvic bone all the way to your tibia down there. Now that muscle is called sartorius, perhaps the longest muscle in the body. You can imagine the muscle fibers are actually that long, almost half a meter, depending on your height. Very long cells. That's the length of a single cell. The only other thing that can mimic that are neurons because of those axons, which can be also very long. In terms of the second concept, what do we say? Now look, this dark rounded things are the nuclei of the, of the muscle. On each, you realize that you can count more than one. You can count more than three actually. We can use this one to tell us that story. Here we can even count about seven or eight or nine, if I'm counting well, this one. So the term given based on the second concept is that skeletal muscle are multinucleated. The multinucleation is actually in the order of hundreds of nuclei. When you talk of multinucleated for skeletal muscle, it does not necessarily mean three. Actually, in essence, there are over 100 nuclei per cell. And this multinucleation comes about from their embryology. When, muscle, when skeletal muscle cells are developing embryologically, there are many smaller cells which are called myoblasts. Those myoblasts usually join together they fuse together. So there are many muscles which fuse together and lose their cell membranes so that they form bit longer things, which we call myotubes. Myotubes are multinucleated. So the multinucleation in skeletal muscles is something that can be explained embryologically. There were different cells which fused together during embryology before a child is born. And thereafter, those muscles are like that. Usually, skeletal muscle cells cannot divide. They are part of those cells which are in the G0 phase. They can't divide after birth. So they only increase in size the size of each cell can increase, but the number, no. So based on the third concept, what do we say? Now, if you look at this again, and perhaps this one is a better one to use, look at the nuclei. They're almost at the cell membrane. So we say that the nuclei are peripheral. The nuclei are in the periphery of the cell, as opposed to being at the center of the cell. Now, how do we assess this one? We assess this one by looking at this muscle. 
light microscope cannot resolve the actin and the myosin, definitely. But there's something that you'll see in light microscope that will tell you or give you some information regarding the arrangement of actin and myosin. And what is that thing? It is what you're seeing here. Here we see alternating light and dark bands looking like uh, those older ion sheets, basically. So this alternating dark and light bands is termed as striation. That skeletal muscle cells are striated or they display cross striations. Striations are alternating dark and light bands. Now, why are they there? They exist because actin and myosin are regularly arranged in skeletal muscles. So because of this regular arrangement of actin and myosin, in a light microscopy, it will appear like we have a zone that is dark and that's the one representing where myosin fibers fall. And you have a zone that is lighter or a band that's lighter. And that's the one that represents where we don't have myosin filaments. We are going to see at an ultra structural level how we call these dark and light bands accurately. But from a light microscopy, we just use the term striations. Then lastly, based on the last concept there, we want to see how the cells join. Now, if you look at this, then you realize that you're not seeing any union actually. And that is true for skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles, the fibers are not really joined they just run parallel. The fibers run parallel. So they run side to side parallel with each other. They don't particularly join. They don't particularly join, they run parallel to each other. Great. So these are the histological features of skeletal muscle cells. Now let's say something from the ultra structural perspective. I think you didn't hear me because uh, there was some unusual signal from Camilla's end, but uh, she's muted. So I think it's better now. Now, when we use the term alta structure, what does it mean? Alta structure simply means from electrical microscope perspective, from electron microscope perspective, what do we see? It simply means it has been highly magnified and largely that applies to electron microscopy. So I just want to highlight those features in electron microscopy, which are of importance with regard to skeletal muscle. So I'll not talk about, oh, they have cell membrane, oh, they have a rough endoplasmic reticulum. No, those ones are standard for, for cells. But what is unique about that alter structure? We've already done the appearance of a cell as seen under electron microscopy. And basically there are many things which are almost the same. I just want to highlight what is unique for skeletal muscle. And one of the unique things in skeletal muscle is that skeletal muscles have very extensive 
smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum in skeletal muscles is very extensive. Actually, not just skeletal muscle, for muscles in general. They have extensive smooth endoplasmic reticulum. That smooth endoplasmic reticulum is highly modified to form what we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's what you're seeing here. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Why should muscles have extensive SAR? When we talked about functions of SAR, we could have highlighted two key roles. We say that SAR is a site of steroid synthesis. And that is still true, except that is not why it is so extensive in skeletal muscle. The reason why it is extensive in skeletal muscle is based on it, the second rule, which we said that SAR is a site for sequestration of calcium, or maybe we use the term storage of calcium. So we like using the term sequestration because it's more of a controlled storage and release. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is very extensive in muscle because of that function of storing and releasing calcium. Calcium is an important ion in contraction of muscles. During contraction, we need a lot of calcium. That calcium, can, we cannot rely on the extracellular fluid to give us that level of calcium that is required in muscle. Yet, you can also not allow that calcium to be just in the, in the cytoplasm because it's going to affect the, the, the electrical potentials of this muscle. It's also going to make that muscle be in a contracted state throughout. So we want somewhere where we can store the calcium, but with easy access. And smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the best shot for muscles. Now, if you see, smooth endoplasmic reticulum has two ends. The end of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, like that one, and that one is known as the terminal system. The ends of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum are known as terminal systems. Now, there's something else that you also need to highlight when you're talking about ultra structure of skeletal muscles. We have the cell membrane of muscle, which is usually called the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma refers to the cell membrane of muscles. At some point, the cell membrane of skeletal muscles invaginates into the muscle. It means it goes in like here. The invaginations of the cell membrane are termed as T tubules. In the understanding that this upper bar of the T represents the cell membrane or sarcolemma, then this lower uh, stroke of the T represents the invagination. So that's what they're called the T tubules. So this is the bar and this is the stroke going down. The T tubules are extensions of the cell membrane into the muscle. Now look at how they interact. The T tubules are sandwiched between two terminal systems. And this constitute what we call the triads. Skeletal muscles have triads. Now, this is unique to skeletal muscles. The triads are unique to skeletal muscle. You don't see them in cardiac muscle. 
where you have an arrangement of a single T tubule surrounded, sandwiched between two terminal cisterns. We call that triads unique to skeletal muscle. And you should now be asking yourself, why do we need such an arrangement of a cell membrane extension abutting a smooth endoplasmic reticulum? What's the relevance? You should be asking yourself that. We're going to answer that shortly. So the other thing that skeletal muscles will have is these extensive filaments. Let's just call them myofilaments. We have the thick and the thin filaments. There are a lot of extensive, or rather there are a lot of myofilaments, both thin and thick. The thin ones are called actin filaments and the thick ones are called myosin filaments. Of course, because contraction requires a lot of energy, then skeletal muscles will also have a lot of mitochondria. And I think that is straightforward. I don't have to be labor in that. Now, the illustration you're seeing right now shows you the regular arrangement of actin and myosin in skeletal muscles. So this, the thick filaments and the thin filaments, they alternate like that and they're regularly arranged like that so that the region where you have the thick filaments will be this region here. It will appear darker on light microscopy. And then the regions which don't have those thick filaments will appear lighter on light microscopy. This is still it. So this is the thick filaments and this is the thin filaments that's actin, this is myosin. Now you see how the actin and the myosin interact very close together. During contraction, they'll just pull each other and we are going to see that shortly. Apart from actin, apart from actin and myosin, which are termed as contractile proteins. There are other proteins which are also still found in muscle. So we have what we're calling tropomyosin and we have troponin. So apart from actin and myosin, which are contractile proteins, we also have tropomyosin and troponin these ones are still found within muscle, except they may not exist as fibers the way actin and myosin exist. I want us to relook at that arrangement of actin and myosin in skeletal muscle and give some particular names of these regions of skeletal muscle. What you're seeing right now can be assumed to be myosin filaments. The thick filaments that we see in skeletal muscle. We've agreed that the filaments are regularly arranged. So let's take these ones to be myosin filaments, the thick filaments, they are regularly arranged. Of course, they are not floating like that they must be attached together. At least one band, in one band, there'll be a zone where they're attached together. The region where myosin filaments are attached together is known as the M line. So those regions you're seeing are called M lines. M for myosin. We've said that the myosin filaments interact and overlap with actin filaments. So let's take the red ones to be the actin filaments, the thin filaments. 
you notice that there's some overlap on either end between actin and myosin. So the red ones are the actin filaments. And just like myosin filaments, the actin filaments are also not just floating. There must be something that anchors them. The point of anchorage of the actin filaments are known as the Z lines. So you've seen the Z line and you've seen the M line. I want us to then define some two bands. So this is what you call the A band and you can see it from that image there. The A band represents the zones that contain myosin filaments. This corresponds to the dark bands on light microscopy. The zones that contain myosin filaments correspond to the dark bands on light microscopy. As opposed to the I band, which represents the regions lacking myosin filaments. This region corresponds to the light bands on light microscopy. Now you realize I have avoided using the term regions containing actin, because if I said vaguely like that, then we will be tempted to say I bind is from here to there, which is not true. I band is just from here to there. So if you want to say that the I band contain actin, it's still okay, but you have to qualify that further and say, so the I band is the region that contain actin only, which means containing actin and lacking myosin. Either way, I want to hear that it does not have myosin. So the I band is a light band on light microscopy. So in skeletal muscle, we'll be having alternating dark and light bands. Now let's see other zones. This is what you call the H zone. You can call it H band or H zone. What is H zone? The H zone is the region within the A band that does not have actin. The region within the A band that lacks actin, that is the H zone. Or we can say is the region within the A band that contains myosin only. So you can sit there. Now, this region from one Z line to the next Z line is what we call the sarcomere. The sarcomere is the functional unit of skeletal muscle. The region between one Z line to the next Z line. It is not the region between one M line and the next M line. It is the region between one Z line and the next Z line. That is what we call the sarcomere. The sarcomere is the functional unit of skeletal muscle. And in this image, we can say we have about four sarcomeres. This one in part, this one in full, that one in full, and that one in part. Right. If we were to look at what you just said from electron microscopy, then this is how it would then appear we'll have a dark region, which are calling the A band, and a lighter region, which are calling the I band. Within the I band, we have the Z line. 
another I band, we have the Z line within the I band. Within the A band, we have the H zone as well as the M line at the center of the H zone. We've agreed that this come because of regular arrangement of actin and myosin. Because the actin and the myosin are regularly arranged, then it will give us this alternating dark and light bands, which in light microscopy we term as striations. We've also agreed that the region from one Z line to the next is what we want to call the sarcomere, which is the functional unit of skeletal muscle. Good. That is how skeletal muscle will look like under microscopy. Now let's see what are the functional properties of skeletal muscle. Now, generally, when you talk about functional properties of any muscle, there's some three things we want to talk about or want you to highlight. One of them is how are the muscles stimulated to contract? On this, there's some two terms that you want to hear. Either of them is the muscle automatic or is it not automatic? When we say a muscle is automatic, it means that it can contract without external stimulation. It can contract spontaneously on itself without any external trigger. And so the opposite is true when we talk about non-automatic. It means that for that muscle to contract, it can only be stimulated from an external force. Contraction is not an intrinsic property of that thing, of that muscle. It must be stimulated for it to contract. It can contract, yes, but the stimulus must come from outside. So those are the two terms we use, and we're going to see for skeletal muscle. So which one do we take out of those two? But the second thing that you look at when you want to describe physiological properties of muscle is how the nervous system controls that muscle. The muscles be controlled by the nervous system, whether they are automatic or not automatic, they will be controlled by the nervous system. But it depends on which division of the nervous system controls them. So on this note, there are two terms to use. The muscle can be controlled voluntarily, which means that it is within your conscious control. You have a conscious control over that muscle. Then we say that muscle is voluntary. When a muscle is voluntary, it means it is innervated by the somatic division of the nervous system. So it enjoys somatic nervous system innervation. The nerve supply is from the somatic nervous system. The opposite involuntary means that you do not have control. You don't have conscious control. Let me use that term, conscious control. You don't have conscious control over that muscle. Muscles which are not within conscious control are therefore innervated by the autonomic division of the nervous system. Could be sympathetic or parasympathetic division, or could be both. But the ones which are not voluntary, the involuntary muscles are innervated by the autonomic division of the nervous system. The last thing we look at is how the muscle fibers contract. And here I want to just see, I've told you that muscle fiber means muscle cell. How do the cells contract? Do all the cells contract together? Then we say the muscle is functionally syncytial or the muscle cells can contract individually. Then we say the muscle is not 
functionally sensitive. There are some things that will make muscle cells to contract as one unit. This is largely based on the presence of gap junctions between them. If there are gap junctions between the cells, electrical impulses travel from one cell to another very fast. You remember we talked about electrical synapses very fast because of the presence of gap junctions the muscles that contain these gap junctions then transmit those events of depolarization very fast between one cell to another and so they will contact as one unit so let's see if whatever i've given you here is general for muscles so suppose the muscle in question is skeletal muscle then what do we take for the first one we can say that skeletal muscles are not automatic they must be stimulated from an external uh, factor for it to contract usually that external stimulation is just a motor neuron it must be stimulated by a motor neuron for it to contract. Based on the second concept, we take voluntary. It means that skeletal muscles are innervated by the somatic division of the nervous system. And therefore, the control of skeletal muscles is within your consciousness. That's why you can decide to slap your neighbor and decide not to slap your neighbor using skeletal muscles. Based on the third concept, we take not functionally sensitive. And this is also partly I've told you that the muscles actually don't join even, they just run parallel. So they don't have gap junctions between them. Therefore, they cannot contract as one unit. It means that one muscle cell can actually contract and the other one is not contracting. It explains to you why sometimes in your eye you might feel some funny contractions in your eyelid and you're wondering, hey, what's happening? It's because some of the muscles are contracting and others are not contracting. We call those ones fasciculations. Skeletal muscles tend to have fasciculations because they're not functionally sensitial. Some muscle cells can contract and others don't contract. We commonly feel that in the eyelid or even in the eye itself when you feel like your eyes moving but not moving but you see, feel some funny Contraction, it's not painful, but it's actually just, you wonder what is it? Those are fasciculations. Right, so these are the physiological properties of skeletal muscle. I want us to now talk about the neuromuscular junction. We have said that skeletal muscles cannot contract without external stimulation. And the stimulation that goes to it is from a motor neuron. The junction between the motor neuron and skeletal muscle is known as the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse. It is not an electrical synapse. It's a chemical synapse. And we talked about the structure of a chemical synapse. We say that chemical synapse must have a presynaptic cell. In this case, the presynaptic cell is the motor neuron. And it must also have a postsynaptic cell. In this case, the postsynaptic cell is skeletal muscle. We also say that a chemical synapse must have some neurotransmitter. The principal neurotransmitter in the neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine. I remember giving an assignment to go list 10 common neurotransmitters. In that list, make sure you have acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is a principal neurotransmitter in 
the neuromuscular junction. It means this is the chemical that is released by the motor neurons so that it can now cause signal transmission across the synapse. There's something called a motor unit. A motor unit refers to a single neuron, sorry, a single motor neuron with all the muscle fibers that particular motor neuron innervates. That's what we call a motor unit. This is a motor unit. A single motor neuron with all the muscle fibers that muscle innervate. Motor units vary. Like this axon, we can say it's going to five muscle fibers. A motor unit can vary. You can have a motor neuron innervating about three to six muscle fibers. Those are the smaller ones. Such motor units will be found where you need a lot of precision, like in your muscles of the eye, the muscles that move the eye, a lot of precision, or the ones that move the fingers when you want to write or may want to sign in a bank as opposed to moving your hand when you want to slap someone. So there are those fine movements. For you to achieve them, you need very precise control. But there are those very gross movements like running around the field or jumping. You really don't need a lot of precision. And those ones, you might be surprised you can actually have a motor neuron supplying about 600 muscle fibers. So the size of the motor neuron, so the size of the motor unit varies depending on the precision. Large motor units are not very precise. They give you gross movements. Smaller motor units are very precise. They'll give you very precise movements. Now, the neuromuscular junction, we have said, is a chemical synapse between a motor neuron and skeletal muscle. There are a number of things that uh, I want us to highlight in this image. See here, the motor neuron is coming in. Usually that motor neuron will have some branches which attach to different parts of the skeletal muscle. The cell membrane of the skeletal muscle that makes contact, or rather that is at the synapse, or so let's say that the postsynaptic membrane, the postsynaptic membrane is of skeletal muscle, of course. We call the postsynaptic membrane the motor end plate. The motor end plate is the postsynaptic membrane, the membrane of the skeletal muscle at the synaptic cleft is called the motor end plate. Now, the motor end plate is usually highly folded like this. It's highly folded. And the reason for the high folding is to increase the surface area over which chemical signaling can occur. So the aim is to increase the surface area. So in as much as the skeletal muscle, the, the, the motor neuron attaches on a small focal region, in terms of the surface area of the cell membrane involved, can actually be very expansive because of the faults of the cell membrane at the motor end plate. I want us to look at signaling at the neuromuscular junction. And this is not necessarily different from the signaling we talked about last Friday 
when we're looking at chemical synapse across neurons. So let's see. One of the things that need to happen is that uh, action potentials need to arrive at the axonal terminal. So let's say action potential arrives at the axonal terminal. We agreed that when action potentials arrive at the axonal terminals, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So voltage-gated calcium channels open, allowing calcium influx at the axonal terminal. When you have calcium influx at the axonal terminal, it will cause the synaptic vesicles to do what? To dock. So docking is the movement of this to the presynaptic membrane. The synaptic vesicles will dock. After the docking of the synaptic vesicles, then the synaptic vesicles will respond by releasing their contents into the synaptic cleft through the process of exocytosis. We've agreed that the chemical contained within these vesicles is acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. Once acetylcholine is in the synaptic cleft, Remember those things we said last time about the many things that can happen to the neurotransmitter or some enzymes can break it down. Maybe it can be absorbed back into this uh, neuron or into another cell, or it can bind to the receptor. Now we are not following those, all those. Let's just focus on the one that causes signal transmission. And the one that causes signal transmission is what? That the acetylcholine will bind to its receptors on the motor end plate. There are different types of receptors of acetylcholine. We generally group them into two. Acetylcholine receptors can either be what we call mascarinic receptors or nicotinic receptors. Mascarinic from the word mascarine and nicotinic from the word nicotine. The mascarinic receptors are found in tissues such as smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and neurons. Well, even exocrine glands, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, neurons, and exocrine glands. That's where you find the mascarinic receptors. We'll be talking about them sometime later when you look at the autonomic nervous system. The nicotinic receptors are of two varieties. The ones found in skeletal muscle are called muscle type nicotinic receptors. And so at the neuromuscular junction, this is the type of the acetylcholine receptor we're going to encounter, the muscle type nicotinic receptors. The other type of nicotinic receptors will be found in junctions of neurons in the autonomic nervous system. So we call them neuronal nicotinic receptors not the subject matter of today, so we can forget about it for now. The key thing here is that acetylcholine binds to its receptors, these ones, and the receptors of acetylcholine here are the muscle type nicotinic receptors. The binding of acetylcholine to its receptors cause, as we agreed last time, opening of the ligand-gated sodium channels. The receptors are ligand-gated sodium channels. 
when they open, we'll have calcium influx into the muscle. And if you have sodium influx into the muscle, it means you're going to have a depolarization in the muscle. That means that you are going to generate an action potential now within the muscle. Simply, that is how signaling takes place at the neuromuscular junction. You've realized it's exactly the same as what we talked about in neurons, except that now we have some specifics. In this case, the postsynaptic cell is not a neuron, it's skeletal muscle. Then the other specific is that the neurotransmitter is not just any neurotransmitter, it is acetylcholine. And that means that the receptors are very unique as well, muscle type nicotinic receptors. The rest of the story has actually remained the same. I want to ask you a question in application to what you just said. That question will pop on your screen. All right, so you are seeing responses, I think. Um, we did this when we were looking at uh, neurons last week, and we agreed on mechanisms of actions of drugs based on how they act at the chemical synapse. So here you're being told that there's a drug that inhibits the neurotransmitter from binding to its receptors. So it's causing competitive inhibition. If a neurotransmitter, if you have a neurotransmitter that causes competitive inhibition, of the muscle type nicotinic receptors. It means that uh, that particular drug, the drug that is causing competitive inhibition will prevent acetylcholine from binding to its receptor. Now you need to ask yourself, why was acetylcholine binding to its receptor on the muscle in the first place? We've already said this. The purpose is so that that muscle can contract. So if you have something that prevents it from binding to its receptor, then it means that that muscle will not contract. So such drugs will be muscle relaxants. Actually, that's one category of muscle relaxants. You'll be talking about muscle relaxants in pharmacology they are called neuromuscular junction blockers. They block the neuromuscular junction. They prevent acetylcholine from binding to its receptors. They'll cause muscle relaxation. I want to give you a break. So it's 9.20. You'll, you'll take 10 minutes break. When we come back at 9.30, we continue from here.
So I suggest we proceed. Okay, maybe we give some people 30 seconds to join. Okay, let's proceed. So I've already told you this, that uh, we can have neuromuscular junction blocking drugs. These drugs which cause competitivity competitive inhibition of the neurotransmitter receptors. The neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine. Therefore, the receptors at the neuromuscular junction are receptors of acetylcholine. Receptors of acetylcholine can simply be called cholinoceptors. So drugs which inhibit cholinoceptors at the neuromuscular junction will prevent signal transmission from the neuron to the skeletal muscle. Therefore, those drugs will cause muscle relaxation because acetylcholine can now not cause signal transmission. That means that now the skeletal muscle will not be activated for contraction. Right, we have already said that. <clears throat> now I want us to look at membrane potentials in skeletal muscle. There are a number of things that we already are aware about. One of them is that uh, skeletal muscles have a resting membrane potential of about negative 90 millivolts. Remember for neurons, we use negative 70. Also, you are now already aware that uh, action potentials are generated in skeletal muscle following cholinergic signaling at the neuromuscular junction. Cholinergic signaling is signaling through acetylcholine. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. When that is successful, then action potentials will be generated in the motor end plate, therefore in the skeletal muscle. The action potential in skeletal muscles lasts for about one to two milliseconds, very short. I hope you remember the ones for neurons were about two to four milliseconds. Action potentials in skeletal muscle last about one to two milliseconds, slightly shorter than the ones in neurons. These action potentials are conducted along the sarcolemma or the cell membrane of the muscle fiber at a velocity of about five meters per second. You'll remember that the one for neurons was a wide range depending on the cross-sectional diameter of the neuron as well as 
the presence of myelination. So the first test of the neurons were about 100 to 120 meters per second. And the slowest of the neurons were even less than one meter per second. And there was a wide variety. When we have action potentials within skeletal muscles, what happened? The action potentials in skeletal muscles are the ones that initiate the contractile response. The purpose of a skeletal muscle experiencing an action potential is so that the muscle can contract. It is not to transmit that signal. To Someone scared the hell out of me. So the purpose of having action potential in skeletal muscle is so that that muscle can contract. It's not the same way we have action potentials in neuron where the purpose is to pass that signal to another cell. In skeletal muscle, the end result is muscle contraction. And so let's see how does the action potential cause the contractile response. So let's take that at the neuromuscular junction, the acetylcholine has caused its signaling at the neuromuscular junction and so has caused a depolarization at the motor end plate. A depolarization has occurred within this skeletal muscle. And so the membrane is experiencing an action potential. That action potential will then spread along the cell membrane, both on that cell membrane or along the T tubule like this. It will spread because the membrane has been depolarized. So the action potential is spreading on the cell membrane, including the invaginations of the cell membrane, which we call the T tubules. Once we have depolarization in the T tubule, what happens? Look, the T tubules are intimate with the terminal systems. The terminal systems are the ends of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, what we call sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if you have depolarization here, the depolarization here cause release of calcium from the terminal systems or from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. So calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. When calcium is released into the cytoplasm, that calcium causes cross-linking of actin and myosin filaments. Now, usually the myosin filaments are like always in motion. When they are not linked with actin, there is no big deal. It will not cause the, the actin to move. But when they are cross-linked, it means they'll now pull the actin. And that's the point. You can assume that the myosin filaments are always in motion, maybe sweeping in one direction constantly. But if they're not linked to actin, it means now they, they just sweep on their own without necessarily moving the actin. But when you cross link them, it means that now they'll pull the actin 
and that is actually what causes contraction. It should be motion of the myosin filaments, not motion of actin. Motion of the myosin filaments cause increased overlap between actin and myosin. And that is what causes contraction. Motion of the myosin filaments. If you have the myosin filaments moving, then they pull along the actin filaments. Then you're going to have an overlap. Let me show you that in a better way. Okay, this one I want to ask you, but let me use this one first. <clears throat> so, in a relaxed state, the actin and the myosin are not bound together. They are not stuck together. So let's say this is myosin and this is actin. In a relaxed state, the myosin and the actin are not linked. But when calcium binds here, the actin and the myosin dock together. And when the actin and myosin dock together, see, when the myosin move, it will pull the actin on that direction. In this state, even if the myosin moves, actin will not move. But in this state, once they have docked, once calcium has bound there, and so actin and myosin are cross-linked, when myosin moves, it will pull the actin. So during contraction, what happens is that now you increase the overlap between actin and myosin. And that brings me to the question I want to ask you. So I want to split you into your groups for three minutes, during which we are going to discuss the events that occur during contraction. What I wanted to discuss is this. This is the sarcomere, Z line, Z line. So this is the sarcomere with the different regions labeled there, I band, A band, H band, M line, and the like. What I want to discuss is what would happen to this sarcomere when actin and myosin have increased overlap. Remember in increased overlap, it means that uh, this overlap from here to here is the overlap. During contraction, this overlap increases. So when you increase this overlap by myosin pulling actin, what happens to these regions? And I want you to tell me what happens to the Z line, what happens to the I band, what happens to the A band, what happens to the H band, what happens to the sarcomere? You can ignore the M line. Yes, but the others you can talk about them. So I'm splitting you into your group so that you do that. Kindly three minutes and please take it serious by the way. I usually log in into your groups and uh, very discouraging to see people are all muted, nobody's talking. But okay, it will cost you one day. That one I can assure you. Because me that me this is how I I assess you by the way.
Right, welcome back. So based on the discussion you've had, I'm giving you a question. So do the question that pops on your screen based on the discussion you've had. Right, let's see. So, um, the majority have gotten right, but still less than less than fifty percent of the class have gotten right. So that was a question. Let's see. So when you have contraction, what happens? First, we've agreed that uh, the overlap between actin and myosin will increase during contraction. So let's look at the lower image. This is the relaxed state, this is the overlap. In a contracted state, this is the overlap. So the overlap between actin and myosin increase. When you have this kind of overlap, look at the locations, the positions of the Z lines, far apart. But when you have increased overlap, the Z lines move closer towards one another. If the Z lines move closer towards one another, then it means that the sarcomere is going to become shorter. This distance from here to here is the sarcomere compared to that distance. Also, if the actin and myosin increase in overlap, then the light band, the eye band, is going to become thinner. Look, this is one half of the eye band. During a relaxed state, so you can imagine something close to this again on this other side. This is one half of the I band in a contracted state. So the I band will become narrower. Compare this with that one. How about the A band? This is the A band from there to there. This is the A band from here to here. It does not change. How about the H band? This is the H band from there to there. And this is now the H band from there to there. So we can say it becomes smaller. Actually, in full contraction, it might completely disappear. 
but you can use the term become smaller. These are the events during muscle contraction. We are now done with skeletal muscle. Now let's rush through the other two types of muscle briefly. Cardiac muscle is found within the myocardial layer of the heart wall. So that is the distribution. In terms of functions, cardiac muscle pump blood to the different parts of the body. So it's function as a pump. Apart from pumping blood to the different parts of the body, cardiac muscle also secretes a particular hormone. That hormone is known as the atrial natriuretic peptide. As the name suggests, it comes from the atrium of the heart. That's one of the chambers of the heart. It's a protein peptide. It's a protein. And uh, it promotes the loss of sodium natri through urine. If you promote the loss of sodium in urine, usually water will also follow urine. Sorry, water will follow sodium. So that means that uh, you will lose a lot of water in urine. If you lose a lot of water in urine, you will lower the blood volume. And if you lower the blood volume, you will lower the blood pressure. So ANP is one such hormone that lowers the blood pressure. This is particularly important in states of fluid overload. Like in patients who have heart failure and the like. What are the histological features of cardiac muscle cells? We agreed on some parameters that we check when you're looking at histology of muscle. Here, we are looking at cardiac muscle. So in terms of the shape of the cells, what do we say here? So this is one cell from there to there. This is another cell from there to there. There's another cell from there to there. The best term to use to describe this is that the cells are short. The fibers are short. All right, I'll raise my voice. So we are saying that uh, the fibers are short because we can see it just from here to here. Unlike in skeletal muscles, where we use the term elongated fibers. Okay, the second thing that we look at is the number of nuclei in a single cell. When you look at this region, you see one nucleus. This one, you see two nuclei. This one, one nucleus. So what do we say? That uh, cardiac muscle cells are either mononucleated or binucleated. A single nucleus or two nuclei based on the location of the nucleus, we can say that the nucleus is centrally located. At the center of the cell, we have the nucleus. Based on the arrangement of actin and myosin, if you look at this region, you'll see alternating dark and light bands. Therefore, we say that cardiac muscle is also striated, just like skeletal muscle. 
And based on how the cells join, we can say that the cells join end to end. Look at this, this muscle here, this is the end and that's the end. The end of this muscle joins the end of the other muscle. The end of this one joins the end of the other one. They join end to end. These junctions of cardiac muscles have their own name. We call them the intercalated discs. So cardiac muscles join end to end through the intercalated discs. It is important for you to know what is contained within the intercalated disc. The intercalated discs contain two things. One is gap junctions. So cardiac muscles have gap junctions between them. And I told you the essence of having gap junctions in muscles. It will give you syncytial contraction. Apart from gap junctions, the other thing contained within the discs are what we call desmosomes. Desmosomes are a bearing junctions. The junctions that connect different cells. Right, so cardiac muscles are joined end to end through intercalated discs. This is an intercalated disc. Intercalated discs contain gap junctions and desmosomes. Desmosomes are a bearing junctions. Another thing we can say about how cardiac muscles join is that the fibers are branched. And this image shows you branching. This cardiac muscle with branching. This is what branching looks like. Or oh, that region, that's branching. This is fiber branching. Again, branching is just unique to cardiac muscles. So let's talk about the physiological properties of cardiac muscles. We had agreed on some three concepts in terms of how the muscle is stimulated to contract, we say cardiac muscle is automatic. This is because it can contract without external stimulation. That does not mean that it does not receive external stimulation. It means that even if that external stimulation is not there, the muscle will still contract. In terms of control, cardiac muscle is involuntary. And what that means is that you do not have conscious control over it. And so the division of the nervous system that controls cardiac muscle is the autonomic nervous system, which can either be sympathetic or parasympathetic. In terms of how the muscles contract, we say cardiac muscle is functionally syncytial. The reason is because there are gap junctions linking these cells together. And so when they contract, they contract as one unit. Surely you want this to happen. You don't want all the muscles of a particular ventricle. You don't want some muscles of a particular ventricle to contract while others are in relaxation. You will not have a pump. You want, if all the muscles if their left ventricle is contracting, then all the muscles of the left ventricle should contract at the same time, then relax at the same time. That is what will give you a pump. That is cardiac muscle. Let's finish with smooth muscle. Smooth muscles are found within the walls of internal hollow organs. When you talk of that, we mean things like the wall of the respiratory tree, the wall of the digestive tract, the wall of the urinary passages, the wall of the reproductive tract. Also, we find smooth muscle in the wall of blood vessels. And so what's their role in those sites? The key functions of smooth muscles are the following. 
Smooth muscles are responsible for transport of substances. Now, this is through the act of peristalsis. Peristalsis, those contractions that uh, are present, for example, in the digestive tract, you realize that sometimes when you eat, not sometimes, all the time when you eat, you really don't care. Now that ugali, where is it? Is it now in the stomach? Okay, maybe it's passing out through the ileum. You don't care. What you care about is you swallow it, then give it some time, you wait for it the other end. Whatever happens through, you have no idea. But smooth muscles are the ones responsible for the movement of that particle of ugali from your mouth all the way to the anal canal. Smooth muscles also control outputs. This output could be output from some chambers through the action of sphincters. For example, the stomach has what you call the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter control output from the stomach. So sphincters are there to open, to allow things to pass and then close when you don't want to allow things to pass. Anal sphincter control output from the rectum. Smooth muscles also control flow by regulating the diameter of a lumen of an organ and this is particularly important for blood vessels. When smooth muscles in blood vessels contract, the lumen of the blood vessels narrow, and that's what we call vasoconstriction. There'll be reduced flow. When the smooth muscles, the wall of a blood vessels relax, then the lumen increases, you increase flow. Last but not least, smooth muscles secrete some vasoactive substances. Substances which have action on the blood vessels themselves. Things like nitric oxide could be produced by smooth muscles and they act on blood vessels by causing vasodilation. So these are the functions of smooth muscle. How do they look like under light microscope? In terms of the shape of the cells, let's pick one. Let's pick this one. That is one cell. This is another one. This is another one. And that's what you'll describe as spindle shaped. There are spindle shaped cells. In terms of the number of nucleus per cell, we can appreciate that uh, we're just seeing a single nucleus in each cell. In terms of the location of the nucleus, we can agree that uh, the nucleus are located at the center. In terms of arrangement of actin and myosin, you do not really see striations in smooth muscle. The reason smooth muscle is not striated is not because it lacks actin and myosin, but because actin and myosin are not regularly arranged in smooth muscle. In terms of how the cells run and join, commonly we say that the muscles exist in bundles. They're just lumps of cells like this. They exist in bundles. But between the cells, there are actually gap junctions. These gap junctions will also enable smooth muscles to contract as one unit. And so that brings me to the functional properties of smooth muscles. In terms of how the muscle is stimulated to contract, 
smooth muscles can contract without external stimulation. So they are automatic. They can contract without external stimulation. That does not mean that they don't need the external stimulation. Or rather, that does not mean that they don't have external stimulant. They still have external stimulant. Except that even if that external stimulant is not existent, the muscle will still contract. In terms of how the central nervous system controls the muscle, and this one has been asked by one of you, we agreed that when you're looking at how muscles are being controlled, you talk about two things. If it is within conscious control, then you say the muscle is voluntary. If it's not within conscious control, then we say the muscle is involuntary. Now, when the muscle is voluntary, which means it is within conscious control, that muscle will be navigated by the somatic nervous system. And that is what applies for skeletal muscle. But if the muscle is not within conscious control, if the muscle is involuntary, that muscle will be innervated by the autonomic nervous system, which can either be sympathetic innervation or parasympathetic innervation. If that be the situation, then we say that that muscle is involuntary. And this is what applies to smooth muscles. They are involuntary. In terms of how the muscles contract, if they contract as one unit, then you call that functionally sensitive. And this is what will apply to smooth muscles as well. Reason being, they have gap junctions between them. So they'll contract as one unit. Right. That's the story of smooth muscle. I think I'll not give this for discussion. You lead on your own at your own time. I think that's better so that you are responsible for yourself. So look at the question. You'll do that at your own time. We've already answered it. So just consolidating. Okay. This is my last slide. We have looked at three types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. We've looked at their characteristics, unique features, and I've told you, you'll now check the unique differences. Those are not the only cells that can contract. There's some other cells which can contract, even though they're not muscle cells. However, they have features which closely resemble smooth muscles. So they're smooth muscle-like cells. What are the examples of such? We have myofibroblasts. We talked about them when we were discussing fibrous connective tissues. We said that the resident cells or one of the resident cells of fibrous connective tissues. We also say that these muscles, these cells can contract and when they do contract, they reduce the size of a wound, so they promote healing in wounds. The second cell type are the myoid cells. We mentioned myoid cells when we were talking about spermatogenesis.
and we said that myid cells are located in the seminiferous tubules of the testes and that when they contract they promote movement of sperms from the wall of the seminiferous tubules into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules and even thereafter we have what you call myoepithelial cells my epithelial cells are found in the secretory portion of exocrine glands. Exocrine glands are glands such as breast, sweat glands, and the like. Glands which produce fluid secretion into a ductal system. In the secretory portion of such glands, we find myoepithelial cells which are contractile cells. Their role is to promote excretion of substances from those secretory portions. The last ones are pericytes. Pericytes are found around capillaries. Their contraction and relaxation influence microcirculation, the blood flow at the organ level is what you're calling microcirculation. So these are the other contractile cells. And that then brings me to the end of the lecture, not just for muscle tissue, but all basic tissues in general. So I'll invite this for questions now. <laughs>